Thomas. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. Before we get going this evening, I want to invite you to join us for worship on the Lord's Day. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna. We're currently going through the Gospel of Luke on Sunday mornings. We just wrapped up the book of Haggai on Sunday evenings. Also, we're having a Sunday school class that goes through the history and the theology of the Reformed faith. And that meets at 10 o'clock in the chapel and would invite you to come and join us uh, for that. We also have a mission work in Logan that meets Sunday evenings at 6.30 p.m. at 1315 East, 700 North. And we'll be up there this uh, Lord's Day and hope you can visit with us soon if you're in that area. Well, before we get going too far, I've been asked by the station management to remind you that as of February 17th, this station and all the others that you're accustomed to will be going away if you're using rabbit ears or some other form of standard antenna. If you're using cable or dish, you're, you're fine already. If you have a uh, television set that is already digital capable, then you're going to be fine. But if you have an old set and have a standard antenna, the whole television system in America is switching over. And you can get a uh, converter box. You, the government will actually give you $40 towards a converter box, and you can get more information by calling 1-888-DTV-2009. Well, with that out of the way, I wanted to try to bring together a number of the things that we've been talking about in recent weeks. And I heard a report about something that happened years ago that I thought would be a good jumping off point. There's a pastor, uh, so-called, that comes to town periodically. He's a street preacher by the name of Michael Warnicke. And he has been arrested down at Brigham Young University back in 1994. He regularly comes to the University of Utah and, and does preaching there. And he is a classic example of the kind of people, he's an extreme example, I'll grant that, but he's a classic example of someone who sees problems in the modern church, but he doesn't see them as a cause for reform, but he sees them as a cause to splinter. The answer to heresy in the minds of many people is schism, to splinter the church. And Michael Warnicke is uh, out of Michigan, and he covers just about all the states, and uh, has even gone to Morocco and been arrested there. And his message is that you don't need a church, that all you need is Jesus. And his message is um, very hostile to any kind of church anywhere. It's not just that this church or that church is corrupt or or uh, has, has drifted from the faith. He believes that all churches everywhere are corrupt and that therefore you need to leave them and that the idea of a body of believers to whom you're accountable, that's something that is, that is foreign to the Bible, he believes. Now, I've been aware of him for a number of years. What I didn't realize until recently is that he was the spiritual leader of Andrea Yates. Andrea Yates, you may remember back about, it's been seven and a half years ago, she drowned her five children. And much of what took place with Andrea Yates, you know, people pointed up in the news that she was following, you know, uh, evangelical Christianity and things like this. That wasn't the case. When you actually find out the details, her husband at the University of uh, Auburn University in Alabama, had come, in, had come under the influence of Michael Warnicke and was struck by his, his seeming devotion, his seeming spirituality. And he played on all the prejudices that, uh, that Rusty Yates had towards the what was known as the institutional church and told him to be really faithful. What he needed to do was to be separate from all that. 
and follow his teachings. And so he does that. They end up marrying. He, he convinces Rusty that he needs to move into a trailer. And they had, uh, eventually they were living with these four kids in a bus. And, you know, how much of this we can't, we can't know for certain uh, played a role in what took place. But this kind of destructive criticism where everybody's wrong everywhere and we're the, we're the ones that are truly godly because we know everyone else's problems. That's something that is not true reform. It's not biblical. There is true criticism. Jesus didn't criticize everything the Pharisees did. He tells them, these things you ought to have done and not left the others undone. What was happening with the Pharisees was that they were doing what they wanted to do to feel godly and to feel right with God, but they weren't doing all the things that God was telling them. What Michael Warnicke was teaching the Yates was that if they weren't totally sold out, if they weren't living the way he was living, then they weren't true Christians and they were under special condemnation. Now that creates a lot of Pharisees, but if you take that kind of thing seriously, it also can destroy you. It can, uh, it can be overwhelming to think that you have to be perfect. And one of the things that happened with Andrea Yates was that she believed she was a bad mother and that her children were stumbling because of this. And one of the false doctrines that's unfortunately popular in a lot of churches is that was taught by Warnicke is that there's an age of accountability. And Andrea Yates took that wrong teaching to its logical conclusion. She believed that her children were not responding well because she wasn't living up to the standard of, of being the perfect mother. And therefore, she killed them before they reached the age of accountability because she believed that by doing so, she prevented them from reaching the age of 12, and then they would have been judged by God. Bad theology kills. It shapes our lives. Now, we engage people and we critique things from a biblical standpoint, but I think that sometimes people miss the distinction between biblical criticism that is done because of a love of Christ, a love of His church, a criticism that is done with grief for those that are in error, as opposed to someone like a Warnicke who dances around and mocks everyone who disagrees with him. That's not what we're to see, to see in the Scriptures. I mean, what we're told to do in the Scriptures. We're supposed to provide an answer for the faith that lies within us with meekness. We're to, we're to speak the truth in love. And so there's an engaging in real comparison of what people teach and believe compared to the Scriptures. But it's done out of love. It's done because truth matters. The problem that we have in our day is that so many people have given up the whole idea of truth that in response to the, the, the worldliness and, and the uncaringness, somebody like a Michael Warnicke seems uh, to, to have a zeal and seems to have answers. I actually had a leader in a church uh, not too far from here quoted to me recently, an elder from that church, saying, I, I wish there was a standard somewhere that would answer all these questions and clear out through all these opinions. And the person who was talking to him said, the Bible, the Bible is there. God's Word is, is clear. It answers these questions. He never thought of it. So you've got this, this sort of weak view of things on the one hand where you know, we're all supposed to get along. We're all supposed to join hands and sing Kumbaya. Uh, next week we have the, uh, the Utah Interfaith Week, and they're going to have a, a uh, concert in celebration of the human spirit with Muslims and Mormons, and the Mormons are, I think, hosting it at the Tabernacle, if I, if I heard correctly. You've got the liberal mainline denominations. You have um, Buddhist and Baha'is and all these others, and it's like, 
What, what are you doing? On the other hand, you've got guys that see error and they're dealing with it, but they're not dealing with it out of love. They're dealing with it to, to make themselves feel better and to try to get people to follow them blindly. And that's basically the springboard I want to use this evening into a phenomenon that I, the best term I know to put to it is called the Church of Bob. How many people view the church in Utah as part of the universal, truly Catholic in the, in the sense of that universal apostolic church? Do they see the church as, as organically linked with all the generations that have gone before us? Do they see it as being established by Christ and being maintained by Him? and corrected and reformed that, like in the history of Israel, there were times they drifted from God's Word, but the church was still there. There were times when it was not as visible as it was at other times. We have the case where Elijah, after Mount Carmel, he hears that uh, Jezebel is seeking his life, and so he flees to Sinai, he goes, he, he prays, Lord, they have slain your prophets, and I alone am left. Let me die. And God says, I have reserved 7,000 men to myself who have not bowed the knee to Baal. The church hasn't always been visible. church has never been perfect. But what is to be our goal when we see that there is error, when we see there is worldliness? The point I've tried to make numerous times is that we should follow the example of Scripture and go back to the Scriptures themselves. It was when Josiah was confronted with the Book of the Covenant that he realizes that Israel had sinned grievously against God. He rends his clothes and confesses his sins and the sins of the people. It's when we go back to God's Word and are changed by it rather than trying to change it to suit us that then we see that restoration to that, uh, to that closer form of what the church is called to be. Now, in the, we've, had represent, we've had members, I, I shouldn't say representatives because none will truly represent the LDS church in, in engaging anyone in any kind of uh, criticism or, or discussion, but we've had members of the LDS church that we have talked to about our views especially a couple weeks ago we had Alma Allred on to talk about the temple. And I think that I, I received criticism from some evangelicals because I wasn't mean to him. Um, I think the, the point was very clear. The, the LDS view of the temple is completely unbiblical. The tabernacle and the temple in Scripture had to do with the, the shedding of blood, the reconciliation of God and man, and that is done away with in Christ, is fulfilled in Him. And you don't see celestial marriage, you don't see these other things, the baptism for the dead, in, anywhere in the Scriptures. You see an offhand reference uh, in 1 Corinthians that is taken out of context. But even in the LDS Scriptures you don't see these things, you don't see um, one of them until 1839 and the other until 1842 being practiced. And so there, there's, there are differences there. And the LDS Church, I think, is a great example of the Church of Bob. It's just the Church of Joseph Smith. Now, we critique the LDS Church and things that we deal with sometimes. But I really don't want that to be the main focus tonight. What I want to focus on is instead the Michael Warnickes of this world, the others that are not like Joseph Smith per se, but many of them are not quite as, as outrageous in their claims, but they're still egocentric in their whole view of the church. It is their church. They start it. They are the ones that found the church. They are the ones who who control everything. And that's not biblical. And unfortunately, 
when we deal as evangelicals with LDS, all too often we completely throw out the whole doctrine of the church. How many times when you have listened to people talk about the gospel with LDS and they, LDS say, well, how do you know yours is the true church? They say, well, churches really don't matter. Or churches really aren't that important. Or churches are secondary. What really matters is just Jesus. And they just blow off the whole doctrine of the church. And the idea that you can have a true church is something that seems to be foreign to the ideas of many in the state. And I think it's a weak point because when LDS read the scriptures, they see that Jesus came to establish a church. What is it that is called the pillar and the ground of the truth? The church. Now, we are not saved by the church. The Bible is not dependent upon the authority of the church. But what is a biblical church? And how does that contrast with the alternative that we see all too often where people create their own churches, what I sort of derisively call the church of Bob, where a Bob or a Joe or a Max or somebody else goes out and they decide they're going to start a church and they do like you see in the, uh, the movie with Robert Duvall, the apostle, they go out into a river and they baptize themselves. I mean, that's... It, Paul tells Timothy not to neglect the gift that was given him through the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. How many churches in this state understand themselves as being connected and accountable? Where is the idea that there is a presbytery? Uh, and, and that's King James, I'm not inventing that. That's not a Presbyterian translation of the Bible. But anyway, I want to open up the phone lines and invite you to call in. What is a biblical church? And, what is, and are these churches that you see, that, uh, these, these phenomena that we see of the house church movement, or these storefront churches uh, where, where somebody has, has started something completely on their own, is that biblical? And is it something that is inherently uh, flawed in every part of it, or is it something that can be reformed? And how? How do we reform the church? And so I invite you to call in. We're going to talk about this in a little bit of detail. Now, one of the things that we see in America is that there is a reaction today to the program-driven church. And I think that that's a, a, a justifiable re uh, reaction in principle. There are many things in the modern church that are unbiblical. The people look at things such as uh, the, the worship service being a revival service meant to get people to walk an aisle and pray a prayer. And people walk the aisle and pray the prayer, and a month later they're gone and you never see them again. And there are churches that teach, well, it doesn't really matter that they're practicing uh, adulterer or, or thief or liar or, or homosexual or whatever. Now, all that really matters is, were they sincere when they prayed that prayer? And people begin to scratch their heads and they begin to say, yeah, is this really what the church is supposed to look like? that we're all doing part of this program and we're all trying to get people to walk in out and pray a prayer, and they may or may not stick. And if they do stick, we make them a cog in the machine to make things bigger. That is unbiblical. Unfortunately, the response of many people to that is unbiblical as well. Another thing that we see, uh, many churches, uh, I use the term uh, generically here, people, what would be called churches, many churches have given up the whole idea of membership. They have no discipline whatsoever. And according to the Protestant reformers, if you don't have discipline, you don't have a church. And I think they're, they're biblical and correct in that. Matthew 18 makes the point, what do you do when a, when a brother sins against you? You go to that brother, you go individually. If he doesn't hear you, you go back with witnesses. And if that doesn't work, then you go and tell it to the church. Where's the church? What church? 
To whom are we accountable? These are things that unfortunately don't get answered by many people. And a lot of these churches, they set themselves up against what they call the institutional or traditional church. And they say, well, we don't have membership. We don't have all these things. Well, then who, who makes the decisions? Bob or Jim or Joe or whoever you want to pick. It's the church of that person. They promise you freedom because they say we don't have membership. So you're not technically accountable to them, but they're not accountable to you either. Who makes the decisions? We have many churches in America where there's notorious sin taking place, but nobody can discipline the pastor because there's no members. We have to recover a biblical understanding of what the church is, that there is the invisible church that is made up of all true believers in all ages and uh, from, from around the world. There are also, uh, there, there's also the visible church. And under normal circumstances, the invisible church is a subset of the visible church. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone who's a member of a church gets saved. It doesn't mean the church saves you. But what is the expectation of someone who comes to faith in Christ? They're added to the church, according to the book of Acts. Well, what is the church to look like? Is there such a thing as a true church? By what standard do we judge these things? We invite you to call in. Our telephone number here is 973-TV20. That's 973-8820. Uh, we have with us Mary Ann from Salt Lake City. Mary Ann, good to have you with us. Thank you, Pastor Jason Wallace. I have a question. Yes, um, how do you feel God will judge the more liberal churches who still practice and preach the Bible, basically, but they're just more liberal? Well, it depends on what you mean by that, because a lot of those so-called uh, liberal churches, they are they're not preaching the gospel really at all. They're using, they're using Christian terminology, but they're not preaching the gospel. And they're not preaching that Jesus is the only way. You listen to, to many people, and they will tell you in these churches that, oh, well, a sincere Buddhist, a sincere Muslim, a sincere Hindu uh, will be right with God. Because they don't think that God is that holy, or sin is that bad, man is that lost, and they don't really see Jesus as that special. And, you know, in, in the um, Presbyterian Church USA, the mainline Presbyterian Church, uh, you had back in the 20s and 30s, people like Pearl Buck, you know, the famous author, she was a missionary to China. She denied that Jesus was born of a virgin. She denied that he rose from the dead. She denied that he was a substitutionary atonement for Christ. Now, she was, in the, she was in the institution of the Presbyterian Church, but what she believed was completely hostile to the Bible and everything that the Presbyterian Church had stood for. But she was within the institution, and they refused to, to discipline her. And now you have, in the mainline Presbyterian Church, you have um, uh, a transvestite that was ordained as a counselor about a dozen years ago. Now you have... Uh, for the last several years, there have been about half a dozen presbyteries that have been actively ordaining homosexuals and lesbians as pastors. They don't stop them. And now the whole General Assembly has voted to start doing this. Uh, they, had a, uh, they had a reimagining conference back about a dozen years ago, sponsored by the Methodists and the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians. And at that uh, service, they worship something that looked like a, a Chinese dragon as the goddess Sophia. And they um, had a communion of honey and milk. That's paganism. That's not Christianity. Even if they say nice things about Jesus, it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it Christian. So I hope that, does that clarify your question? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh very much so. Uh, 
And what church did this occur at where they did the pagan worship? What denomination or church? Uh, it was sponsored, this was a women's conference put on by the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Methodist, I believe the Episcopalians were involved, and maybe Disciples of Christ. Several of the, the liberal denominations were involved. The, the reimagining group is still active. There were a few people that lost positions in the, in the PCUSA bureaucracy, but the movement is still there and still has their celebrations. And um, in the Episcopal Church, uh, the, the, the main website for the Episcopal Church USA, I think it's been about two years ago, they had an alternative worship service, or excuse me, communion service, uh, an alternative Eucharist, as they would call it, that instead of having uh, bread and wine, they were to offer raisin cakes to the Queen of Heaven, a practice that was specifically denounced in Hosea and Jeremiah as a reason that God was going to destroy Israel. And they, 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 tell, they tell us, well, we're still Christian. We're just worshiping the, the divine feminine. That's, a, that's idolatry. Now, an institution doesn't make you right, but I think that people often will see this, this liberalism and this, this um, apostasy, and they swing the pendulum to the other side, and they say, well, to be true, now we have to follow somebody like a Michael Warnicke. And we're going to start our own church without any concern for reforming the church, without any concern for, uh, for any kind of connectionalism. And it really boils down much to the same mentality of Joseph Smith. I, I didn't bring the, the quote with me this evening, but Chrysostom, back in the fourth century, describes a situation almost identical to Joseph Smith looking at the, the schisms and the errors and the heresies in the church and saying, you know, where is the truth? What must I follow? He said, read the Bible and the Bible will give you your answers. But most people don't want to read the Bible or when they do read it, they don't like what it says because God is not a teddy bear. You know, God is not a grandfather in the sky that just wants to see you enjoy yourself. God is holy. Now, the love of God is far more profound than they would ever want, uh, than, than they could ever imagine as well, but they don't care. P most people don't want a God that they have to serve and be changed by. They want a genie in a bottle that can rub the lamp and give him their commands and shove him back in the bottle and not have to deal with him. They want a manageable deity. But anyway, hey, thank you for the call. If you'd like to join in the conversation, the telephone number here is 973-TV20. That's 973-8820. How many of you have been drawn to the, the, the house church movement? Now, there are Christians that have met in houses all the way back to the earliest days, but the book of Acts. But the question I have for you is, does meeting in a house make you faithful? Does meeting in a house make you necessarily better than someone that meets in a building dedicated for worship. I hear people rail against the institutional church. And they say, you know, we don't need all that. We don't need members, you know, membership, which would be accountability in the local church. And we don't need connections with other churches. Then how in the world do you practice Matthew 18 if you don't have a visible church. Unfortunately, what generally happens is when there's a problem, somebody goes out and they tell the friends that they can rally to uh, tell them how bad this person was to them, and the other person goes out and rallies people, and it ends up in splintering churches. It ends up in, in creating all kinds of bitterness. On the other hand, if you don't have connections between churches, how do you ever practice in Acts 15? Remember the Jerusalem Council? Did the need to deal with error end with the time of the apostles? Or do we actually need to have, be able to have councils of the church now? Do we need to be able to come together and, and submit ourselves to our brothers? Maybe I'm being a little bit vague in all this, but... Um, 
I, I, I think that there is a, a fundamental weakness in much of the, the evangelical community here in, in Utah, and that is that we don't appreciate the church the way we should. We end up divorcing the bride from the bridegroom. We end up uh, severing the head from the body. Because it's not just the Michael Warnickeys who tell people, you don't need a church, all you need is Jesus. And if they do say something about the church, what they mean is not a biblical view of the church. It's maybe an invisible entity only, where there are no elders, there, are no, there is no accountability, there, there is no discipline, and they get to choose, pick and choose what they want. How do you deal with that? I think that until we reform the church, and this is a note I've sounded many times and I'll keep sounding it, until we reform the church and make it more biblical, I don't think that we should expect LDS to take us seriously. Latter-day Saints, they have structure, they have accountability, they have leadership. You know, you can rail, I mean, you can, you can question, I mean, I think that they're wrong in, in much of their leadership, and just like on the doctrine of, of the temple, they've, they've completely misunderstood what Christ has fulfilled and what, uh, and what is continuing. But where are the elders in the local churches? Where is Matthew 18 discipline? We had, we've had one formal discipline case in just over 10 years. And you would have thought that we had been pinching the heads off babies according to some of the churches around here. We did it with tears. We did it over months. We, we implored the person to, to be biblical and to honor their vows. We wept over it. And the response I got from pastors that are supposed to be biblical, unfortunately, all too often was, oh, you don't do that. You just let people go. You know, if, if, if the idea is if dip, discipline starts and somebody says, well, I, wanna, I just want to leave, then you can't follow it through to the rest of it. And we had people say, well, you're just as bad as the Mormons. No, we're being biblical. How do you regain a brother? How do you restore someone that's in sin? We need to recapture the idea that we are one church and that when we don't reflect that, that is a scandal. If we are truly Christians, it should be a scandal to us that there is division. But that division is not to be healed through some lowest common denominator, warm, fuzzy feeling. It's to be dealt with like the Bereans. It's to be dealt with like the Jerusalem Council where we come together and we deal with the scriptures and we make decisions on the basis of truth. Now next week I'm going to have a Baptist pastor as a guest on the show. And I would agree with him on almost everything other than baptism. But baptism is a serious issue. I believe that he is an error. He believes that I'm an error. And my hope is that we're going to see that difference between us resolved as we try to be good Bereans and deal with what the Scripture says. We point, the, we point the LDS to the Scriptures all the time, but unfortunately we don't see that kind of concern between evangelicals. We're told we're just supposed to shut up and not talk about these things. So, anyway, I'm, uh, we have with us Helen from uh, Clearfield, looks like. Helen, good to have you with us this evening. Hello. Um, like I was saying to the lady, I don't, uh, I don't know your name. This is the first time I've ever heard, uh, watched you on television, so I'm sorry if I oh, didn't address not, you by your name. Not what a problem. I'm name? Jason Wallace. Okay. okay what I want to know is, uh, I, came, I came out of a cult, the mm -hmm. Worldwide Church of God, okay? Oh, Her you, Herbert W. Armstrong. Yes. <laughs> into Christianity, and since I've been into Christianity, I've been attending 
uh, this Christian church, and I see that uh, I'm kind of—I don't know—I'm I'm, kind of concerned because we were very strict in the cult, even though you know we didn't understand Christ like we should have, and we walked in the law. But I see that they don't keep. I, I am not really sure if this is wrong or not. But they, where the minister preaches, they will have at times dances. They will dance there. They will have um, all kinds of uh, recreation. And I'm thinking, is this right? No. And that's my question. Okay, I appreciate the question because th this is this is the egocentric kind of thing that we see people do. Uh, they, they, they feel they're cut off from, from any connectionalism and they get to make it up as they go along and they think, well, dancing would be fun. Um, Helen, appreciate the call. I'll be answering some more um, on this. Um, we're, we're getting a little interference with um, keeping the phone line open. But no, uh, David danced before the Lord, but that is not part of corporate worship. It is something you, you go... The idea of many churches today, this, this sort of egocentric, you know, Bob's church, Church of Bob, you know, where one man basically defines something or, or leads people into some novel interpretation of things. They're basically saying, well, all the churches that have gone before us that didn't have dancing they just didn't understand the Bible, or they didn't have the Spirit. Or somehow things have radically changed, and now we're going to do things completely different than everyone has done before. Now the whole concept of this program is that we need to go back to the old ways. We need to realize that what has sustained God's church through the ages is the same thing that will sustain them in our day that we haven't radically changed. The, the, the times are not radically different. We need to still be doing the same things. Uh, there's a reason that churches for, what, 2,000 years roughly, did not have dancing as part of corporate worship because they understood that when we come together, God has prescribed how He is to be worshiped. There's to be the reading of the Scriptures, the, the, ex, the exposition of those scriptures, prayer, congregational singing, and the sacraments. These are standard things that are to be done. Now, if you want to get together and have a fellowship and, and have somebody dance or something like that, maybe that would be acceptable. But when we come together on the Lord's Day, we don't define worship. God does. And worship isn't just what we do to make ourselves feel better or entertain people or, or to manipulate people into trying to make decisions for Jesus, as they would say. Worship is what we offer to God. It is our praise. And there, there's an arrogance. And it's not just in the house churches and just in the, in the Michael Warnickeys and, the, and, and these kinds of folks out there. But there's an arrogance that... The church has never really understood things until me. And now we really understand them. You know, the idea in the Presbyterian church in the 1920s was no one really understood up till now that we can start ordaining women deacons. And then the 1930s, women elders. 1950s, women pastors. And now they're ordaining homosexuals, lesbians, and drag queens. That's wrong. God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what we are called to, you know, the, the children of Israel thought it was a bright idea to worship a golden calf. They were wrong. It was fun. They danced. They played. But anyway, I'm holding up one of our callers here. We have Alex from Orem. Good to have you with us. Oh, pleasure to speak with you, Jason. I felt inspired to call you when you made a reference uh, to St. John Chrysostom before. I went to a school by that name, actually. Oh, good. Uh, in any case, I wanted to ask you if you think you have the power to forgive sins, Jason. Do I have the power to forgive sins? Yeah, but, do you have that power? Uh, I believe that Jesus Christ has that power. Christ has that power? Yes. 
I, I, I'm, I'm asking you, do you have the power to forgive sins on earth? I believe that the church is able to make judgments as the church. Do I have a priestly power? No. In, okay, in the, what did the, Jesus the, mean you, by it then? Are you... You have to give Did me a, he uh, say that, you, you know, that we were going to be given that power to forgive sins? Give me the quote, or give me the citation, please. Did you hear me? Yeah, if I'm asking you, could you please give me the citation from Scripture? Oh, I, I don't have it, uh, you know, I'm not a, 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 a walking encyclopedia like you are, but I'm, I, I know that it's in there. I mean, it's in the Lord's Prayer as well, but the, the, it, the message comes across pretty clear to me that Jesus gives us the power to forgive sins. I'm asking, you know, is that the power of the church or the person? What, what's your take on that? Are you talking about the, the power to bind and to loose and what, what you will bind on earth will be bound in heaven? Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, I'm talking about that. That's one sense of it. But I think it's explicitly said by Jesus that we are given the power, that he's going to bestow the power upon us to forgive sins. I'm, I'm trying to understand where you're coming from in all this. You know, and, 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 and this is what I uh, basically t want to touch upon it, with you, is that I just get the sense that, uh, that w when you have uh, storefront Christianity, like you're making a reference to, I hate to say it, Sean uh, kind of McCraney strikes me as that kind of person. He's always telling everybody, don't believe me, go to the scriptures. And it seems like it's Protestantism run amok, especially with this example of this Michael fellow from uh, Michigan, that uh, basically it's, it's, uh, you know, it's the same feeling. It's the same feeling, is that the, all you need is your scripture, you need your Bible, is all you basically need. You go in your closet and you pray to God, and, and it's, 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 uh, it's disjointed. It's, it's run amok. And I th are you coming from a Roman Catholic background yourself or, or Eastern Orthodox? I'm sorry? Are you, are you Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox? I'm Catholic. Okay. The, the point that I would be making in all this is that the medieval Roman Catholic Church is guilty of the same arrogance, the same innovation, that you see from the Michael Warnickes and from uh, now, just because a church meets in a house doesn't make them schismatic and nutty, or in a storefront. Uh, let me qualify that. Uh, churches can meet in all kinds of strange places, but the mindset of many of these churches, what I'm criticizing. But coming back to medieval Roman Catholicism, it is not Catholic in the true sense of that. The, there, is, there is a danger, yes, I think people have overreacted against Mormonism and Roman Catholicism, but Roman Catholicism has its own errors that are out of accord with the historic testimony of the church, the historic understanding of Scripture. What you find is that they claim the power to forgive sins, and that power was used in the 16th century to fund the or that supposed power, I should say, was sold by the Roman Catholic Church to the Fugers, who then went out and hawked indulgences that if you would pay a certain price, your loved ones could be gotten out of purgatory uh, immediately. And you could get forgiveness of sins, not only for sins past, but sins future as well. And you could buy God off with the offering of money. I don't agree with that, by the way, and I believe that there are lots of errors if you want to go back hundreds of years and find lots of errors in its practice. I didn't call up to defend it all the way through, and I know that there, there are many faults throughout the centuries, and we can probably find fault with each other's church if we really want to look hard. I, I just basically wanted to ask you a couple of things. You made also, by the way, a mention of somebody who, uh, who you say, well, just read your Bible because he doesn't know the answers to many things. What's your feeling on the catechism, by the way? Okay, we're, we're, we're shifting subjects here. Uh, you mean on the, the new Catholic catechism? Is Are you that able to hear me? It seems like I'm not coming through to you sometimes. I'm, I'm hearing you. I don't think you're hearing me as well. The, are you talking about the new Catholic catechism? I'm talking about the catechism because it's a good reference book, and I get the feeling that a lot of people don't know anything about the Catholic Church or uh, answers to simple questions that they can basically look it up as a reference book. And I, I know that I go in there, and I've actually heard other uh, uh, you know pastors like you in times past say that they believe, uh, you know, sometimes in excess of 90 or 95 percent of the things that it says in there. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with you that our Bible is, is numero uno, you know, it's the most important thing, and we, 
uh, sacred scripture, scripture and the canon of scripture obviously was passed down and was a very, a very deliberate thing throughout the uh, Church Fathers and its history of the Church. But I also believe that if you want simple answers sometimes, you just go to the Catechism, you look it up in the index, and then you go to the page and read. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I guess I'm curious I, about a lot of different things, Jason. I'm sorry that I opened up so many venues here. That's okay. I, I will try to deal with, with them briefly and uh, invite you to call back in, and we'll, we'll try to flesh it out on some future shows. Okay. I appreciate we, it, Jason. Hey, thank you. The, one of the things that all too often happens is people react against an extreme. People see that Roman Catholicism is not biblical. They see that purgatory, transubstantiation, uh, the, the, the whole idea of priest having the power to forgive sins, whether or not the person is, is truly repentant, uh, all these things are, um, are unbiblical. So they swing the pendulum to the other extreme and they deny the Catholicity of the church. They deny the historicity of the church. They say that, you know, we, we are doing something new and novel. We're, um, you know, we're restoring the church that had ceased to exist. And then people see that and then they react back into Roman Catholicism. I think that people need to hear both sides because there are some legitimate critiques out there from both directions. Roman Catholics have a point when they look at the splintered, um, egocentric nature of Protestantism. Their answer is not biblical though. What's, what's true is that this splintered, egocentric nature of much of Protestantism is the very thing that caused the Protestant Reformation in the first place, not the way they think, but because the Roman Catholic Church had ceased to be Catholic many, many years before. More and more error crept in until the gospel was, full, was flatly denied. And so, you know, it, it became much like what we see elsewhere. I'll try to flesh that out a little more, but we have a caller, uh, Matt from Ogden. Good to have you with us. Yeah, you need to turn down your television sound. Hi, Pastor Wallace. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, to... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment to tie into uh, your caller Alex's question regarding the authority of the church. Um, you know, his reference is to uh, Matthew 18, where it talks about that, where Jesus tells the disciples, I've given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be you know, and so forth. They'd be loose on earth, will be loosed in heaven. Yeah, that was actually. The... If you look at the the Greek there, it's a it's a future perfect passive in the verb, mm -hmm. which uh, which uh, means it doesn't mean that I'm giving you the power, and what you do on earth, I will ratify in heaven. But it really means that what you do on earth will have already been ratified in heaven. That essentially it's outworking what has already been decreed in heaven. Yeah, and and I think that uh, perhaps maybe for the next few minutes you could talk about that. The fact that that the church is God's vehicle for moving on the earth. It's that we don't have power over God by being a priest and have power to forgive sins. But the church, God does move through the church. He does make decrees through the church. And when we have this splintered church as we do today, it, I think that that does injustice to what Christ did set up there in Matthew 18. And uh, I'll go ahead and hang up now and let okay. you comment. Thanks. Thank you so much. One of the things I would add, I think Matt nailed it perfectly. His Greek is, is um, <laughs> sharper than mine at the moment. Uh, I also don't have the Greek in front of me, but uh, one, of the thing, one of the context issues there is that the power to bind and to loose was something that was claimed by the scribes to author authoritatively interpret the law. And we see that the apostles were given that authority and that it is carried over in the authority of the New Testament, which comes uh, from the apostles. It's, it's apostolic in its origin. The, the central focus of what I'm trying to get through, across tonight is we need to take off our blinders. We need, when, when you're in a church that you've got somebody claiming that everybody's wrong, no one's ever understood these things except maybe you know, a few people here and there uh, that you've never heard of before and have been dead a long, long time, um, there's a problem. 
you're basically saying that the church either has not had God's word or it hasn't had his spirit. The Mormon church, they get around all that by saying, well, there's this great apostasy and the church has ceased to exist. They open up all kinds of other problems and they're completely unbiblical in their understanding of God and the gospel and everything else. But if we believe that God his word and His Spirit have been there, and that Spirit was promised to lead us into truth, we should be basically in line with the generations that have gone before us. When the Protestant reformers were reading their Bibles, they were finding that not only were they reading them very differently than the Roman Catholic Church was reading them, but they were understanding that they were coming to the same conclusions that Chrysostom and a whole host of other people were coming to. They were reading things like when Gregory the Great in the 6th century, one of the, a bishop of Rome, you know, one of the first modern popes, many people would say, Gregory said that anyone who claims to be the universal bishop is the Antichrist. Now, considering that his supposed successors claim to be the universal bishop, that's a problem. When they, when they were going back and reading Augustine, and they were reading the church councils, they were finding, you know, we don't agree with every single point of every single one of these guys, but we find that there is this, this, this mainstream of Christian understanding, and that in the Middle Ages, in Western Europe, it went off the tracks. And the, because of the breakdown in society and a whole host of other things, people just weren't reading, and they didn't have the Bibles readily available. And people lost the ability to read. Uh, literacy dropped dramatically during the Middle Ages. But then as the printing press and other, other technological advances came, they were able to read their Bibles and they began to say, this isn't the same. Are we truly Catholic in the true sense of that? Are we understanding that there is no private interpretation of Scripture? And that when a Joseph Smith comes along, or some modern evangelical who, who says, the institutional church is completely wrong and all these things, and we're going to do something completely different. We're not going to reform the church. And we're not going to entertain any dialogue and criticism. We're just going to sit back and we're going to take pot shots at them. That's the, that's the mindset of Joseph Smith and Herbert W. Armstrong and Ellen G. White, and you go down the list. To a child of God, when they see the church divided, when they see the church weak and not very faithful, it is a matter for tears. Unfortunately, all too often in our, in our instant age of, of, age of instant gratification, Americans say, well, we just need to get past this. But they don't want to do the hard work. You know, I hold to a position that is the, the historic position of the church, which is that believers are to be baptized and their children. And people say, well, that's Roman Catholicism. No, it's not. It's biblical. And I challenge anybody who disagrees, let's be good Bereans and go through the Scriptures. Unfortunately, most people don't. They don't want to go to the Scriptures. They don't want to work out the problems. They tell us, well, that doesn't matter. Why do we even have to talk about this? Let's just talk about Jesus. Jesus came to save His people. And He came to establish a church. We are not saved by the church, but we are saved into that church. And it is the pillar and ground of the truth. It is promised that it is the church against which the gates of hell will not prevail. And yet, what do we see? People don't want to take the church seriously. They don't want to take seriously that, when, that our calling is to come together and worship God. The temple has been done away with, but the service of the temple really hasn't. We're not bringing sacrifices of blood. We are bringing sacrifices of praise. 
we underestimate the church, we underestimate our worship, we underestimate our accountability, we underestimate the community in the true sense of that, and we undermine these things. Well, in future weeks, we're going to try to flesh this out some more, but be aware of the church of Bob or the church of Pope Pius or the church of anybody. If, if our church ever becomes the church of Jason, God help us, and may the elders stand up and take, um, and take charge and understand they're going to answer to a holy God and that they need to, to remove me. May we be instead the church of Jesus Christ, truly apostolic and truly Catholic. We need to be where and be delivered from the churches of Bob or Joe or Jason or anybody else. Well, we've reached the end of another episode, and um, I hope I've given you some grist for the mill. What we need is a reformation, as we've seen throughout church history, by going back to God's Word, back to our knees, and back into community, and long to see His church pure and, and zealous for Him. I invite you to worship with us. We meet at East 630 West, 2700 South, 11 a.m., and 5.30 p.m. If you like more information, please go to our website, ancientpaths.tv. Until next time, I'm Jason Wallace, and we wish you the Lord's blessings. Good night. Hear, oh, hear.